Jared Poland Frono's photo. Dot com, and this is a user's guide for the Canon EOS R5. Now, I do want to warn you that this is going to be a pretty long video because I want to show you the outside of the camera as well as the settings that I would personally set the camera to if I was just getting it right out of the box. Now, I do want to congratulate you on purchasing this camera if you purchased it, or if you're thinking about purchasing one, check the links out down below because we do have a real world review where I use this in the real world to show you how it acts, guess where? In the real world. Now, before I jump into the outside of the camera and showing you how to put on the lens and where the memory cards go, if that's too basic for you, you can jump ahead to a different section where I'm going through how I would set up the menu, but I still think it's important for anybody who's just picking up this camera who just needs some of the basic information. I wanna get that out to them. So let's start going over the outside of the camera. So here we go. Let's start with the bottom of the camera where the battery goes, because you need to power it some way. Flick this door open. This is where your battery goes. Pop that white switch. Here is your battery. Now, I always recommend that you have multiple batteries, at least two. Spend the extra money, get a second battery, keep it charged up, rotate through them, because when you're traveling, the last thing you want to have happen is a battery either gets lost or you find out that it's not charged from the day before and you totally used it and now you can't shoot until it's charged again. To put it in, it can only go one way. You put the contacts down. You flick this white switch like that, you pop it in, you hear the click, it's now in there. Shut the door and you're good to go. Now you may have noticed something inside that I didn't mention just yet. This is a little connector. This is where if you got a vertical grip, a battery grip, it would connect right into there, screw into the bottom of the camera. You would take the battery out because the battery would then go into the battery pack. Now, speaking of screwing things into the camera, right here is where you put your tripod plate. This is your quarter 20. That's how you mount to a tripod or a gorilla pod or any type of thing like a switch pod uh, to, to mount your camera. Now, moving over to the right side of the camera, this is where your card slots are. You just literally press and slide that way. You hear the click, just press, boom, it flips open. And in here, we have two types of memory card media. This is a CF Express Type B card from ProGrade Digital. That goes right into this slot. Boom, it clicks in right here. We have an SD card. You press down to take it out. This is a ProGrade Digital 64 gigabyte card. You pop it in here. Boom, they're both in there. You hear the click, shut the door, and now your cards are in the camera. Moving around to the front of the camera, I want to show you how to take the lens off and as well put the lens on. This was one of the scariest things when I first had my, my first film camera was, how do I take the lens off? How do I put the lens on? Well, it's really simple. So I'm not going to show you me taking it off yet, but here, the lens is off. This is the lens and this is the body. Right here, that is your shutter. You do not want to touch the shutter because behind that is your image sensor. The shutter is down. There is an option when the camera goes off to have the shutter stay up and expose the sensor at all times. That's just going to be personal preference whether you want that to happen or not. But you don't want to touch this. You don't want to get anything in here. You try to keep it as dust free as possible. Uh, you don't want to blow any air in here with compressed air. That could be a bad thing. But how do we put the lens on? You see this red line right here. There's a red line there. There's a red line right there on the mount of the camera. We line those two things up like this. And I'm holding it with my left hand, so I'm going to rotate away from me with my right. You hear the click? The lens is now on. To take the lens off, you've got a lens release button right here on the right. You press that. You rotate the lens towards you, at least if it's in your left hand. You take it off, and it's off. Put it back on. Click and you're good to go. Now I currently have on there the 50 millimeter RF 1.8. It's a pretty affordable, really fantastic little lens that I recommend a lot of people get. But to check out the full lineup of Canon RF lenses, head on over to canon.us slash fro RF lenses to see all of the different lenses that they offer. Now that we got all of that stuff out of the way, we got the battery in the camera, we got the cards in the camera, we got the lens on the camera. How do we turn it on? Oh, I don't, I don't know right here maybe. The switch that says on and off. Yep, switch, boom. It's now on. Off, it's now off. I know it's simple, but you know, it's just 
you just gotta say it. Uh, moving around the top of the camera, this is your hot shoe. A hot shoe is where you would put a flash if you wanna put the flash on camera. That's why it's a hot shoe, it's active. It's gonna send power through it. You could also use a microphone. This is where you could slide a microphone if you're gonna be recording video uh, and you wanna override the mics in the camera and use, say, a shotgun mic. You could then put it right in here in the hot shoe facing forward, or honestly, you could face it backwards if you really, really wanted to. Uh, to the right of that, you have a top info display. This is really a display that I kind of don't use very often at this point because it's small. And to be honest with you, I can look through the electronic viewfinder, which is right here. This is the electronic viewfinder. It shows you everything that you see with your camera. You can review your menu through there, but it's also how you see the image that the sensor is absorbing when it's on or when you're capturing images. So this is what's called an EVF, an electronic viewfinder. The old school way was an optical viewfinder, meaning when you looked through there, there was a prism and then there was a mirror and you would see through the lens. In this case, the lens gathers the light, the image sensor then processes it and then shows it to you on the little TV screen called the EVF inside of the viewfinder. Now, right below that is a proximity sensor. So that means when you put your eye up to the viewfinder, it's going to turn off the display, which we haven't even mentioned yet, but this is your display that is touch display. You can touch, you can pinch to zoom your images, and you can control your menu from here. You could also swipe and do all those different things. But the proximity sensor's right here. It activates when you put your eye up to it, and it deactivates when you take your eye away from it. Now, you can change a bunch of different settings for whether it stays on all the time or it never goes on. We'll get to that in the menu system. But actually, why don't I just show you by turning the camera on? So watch. Proximity. Ooh, look at that. The screen goes off. Ooh, look at that, the screen goes on. The screen goes off, the screen goes on. Touch screen, look, I can touch it and things are happening. I can touch it, things are happening. The same thing will show up in the electronic viewfinder. And a little word of advice here, if you're shooting outside and you get some rain on the viewfinder and you're like, wait a second, my eye isn't up to it, but the screen is dark, that's because you may have gotten some schmutz, schmutz is a word, uh, or rain on it, and I've seen that happen in the past. You just dry it off and then you're good to go right there. Turning the camera off, since we talked about the electronic viewfinder, I wanna talk about people who wear glasses or who need to correct their eyes if they're not wearing glasses and looking through the electronic viewfinder. You have a diopter right here. This is a diopter dial that you can swipe up and you can swipe down. It's gonna help you see the screen, the electronic viewfinder more clearly. The way that you set it up is you turn the camera on, you go into the menu mode and you can see the text that's on the screen. So just simply turn this diopter dial until it's nice and sharp for you, for your eyes, and then you should be set. Now let's talk about the touch screen, which I already mentioned, that's right here. It can flip out and rotate. You can close it like that. So it's gonna protect the screen if it's closed, if it's in a bag. Um, generally speaking, you don't wanna break the screen. That's something that would be pretty expensive to replace. But you also have a flip out rotatable screen. If you're someone who's gonna be videoing yourself, you can turn it this way so that you can see it. And then, oh, look at me, I'm off to the side. Or if you need to get photographs where maybe you need to photograph over people, you could hold it up like this. Or if you're down low on the ground, you can turn the screen down like this and photograph that way. So I generally just leave it like this faced out because I'm gonna use the screen when I'm shooting. Um, I guess if you're gonna put it in a bag, it wouldn't hurt to just rotate it around. But if you're gonna be shooting quick, and you want it always out, boom, you could have it out just like this. Moving to the top of the camera because there's quite a lot here. We already talked about the top display. We've got a mode dial where you would hit that to change your modes from video to photo. You have a command dial that can control your aperture, your shutter speed, or your ISO, depending on how you set your camera. You've got a button right here which will illuminate this screen. It doesn't illuminate it very bright, but it also will change the screen of the top dial. Next to that, we've got the lock button. Let's say, for example, you don't want the touch screen to be active because for some reason you may accidentally hit it and you don't want it to be active. You could literally hit that lock button and if you have that option selected to not have the screen be active at that time, then it will lock the screen. There's a whole bunch of different features that you could add to the lock button. I will show you that when we go inside the camera as well. This red button, that's your record button to start 
as well as stop video recording, it's pretty self-explanatory. We have another command dial right here that can control your shutter speed, your aperture, your ISO, depending on how you want to set it. I will show you how I like to set it when we get into the menu. This is a very powerful button. It's the MFN button. This one allows you to make changes quickly uh, with your eye up to the viewfinder when you need to make changes of say the ISO or you want to change your focusing mode. It's like a quick button. There is a Q button back here that we haven't talked about yet, but it's very similar to that because it gives you a lot of, it, it basically activates your ability to make changes quickly with your eye up to the viewfinder. Now this is an important button. It's your shutter button. That's the one that you will press halfway down to activate your focus, uh, to activate the meter, but also to activate the continuous autofocus. And when you press it all the way down, that's when you take photos. So if you're sitting there at home and you're wondering how much pressure to put on it, it's simple. If you press it, gently, a half press, you can feel that it gives some give. Now, to go all the way, you just press it down all the way, and you can feel the difference when you're taking the pictures. Let's talk about more buttons. We got the back of the camera right here. We'll start off here on the right-hand side. We've got the rate button. So if you take a photograph and you say you want to star it uh, to come up in Adobe Lightroom or something that it has a star on it, that is one that you picked, you can go ahead and do that and it will save that into the file. You've got the menu button. The menu button does what? It launches the menu. That's how you're going to control it. Well, I'll just show you real fast. Turn the camera on. We hit the menu button and here is your menu that you can touch through and go through all of the different settings just like that. Really nice screen, really nice touch features. Uh, we can turn it back off right now. This is your joystick to the right. Your thumb will rest on it and just move up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, BA, select, start. Not really, but that is your joystick. And if you get it and you're old, and I mean, we're not that old if you get it. Yeah, you're probably in your 30s and 40s if you get it. Leave a comment down below that hashtag I got it. I know what you're talking about. So that's your joystick. You can use that in the menu. You can use that to get around your images uh, when you're previewing them, even though you can just pinch and zoom because it is a touch screen. Next to that is your AF on button. If you want to activate your autofocus, you could do that with the back button. But the great thing about most of these buttons is that they're highly mappable, is that you can tell the system what you want this button to do. So if you want this button to do something else, you can go ahead and change that and we'll see that when we get into the menu system as well. Then you have two more function buttons here that you can also make changes to. I usually map these with different options. We'll see that in the menu. We've got the magnifying glass, which is if you want to zoom in on an image, you would hit the magnifying glass and boom, it zooms in on that image and you can change the magnification in the menu system also. This is the info button. It brings up info on a photo when you are previewing it, when you're doing the playback. It will change the screen to, to show you different info on there. It will cycle through different options. The Q button is super powerful. It's like having access to the entire menu system of important things right on the back of the camera with one press of the button. You would go ahead and press the Q button and it brings up all of these different options that you can quickly get to. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you Fropack 3 in action on this photo taken with the Canon EOS R5. We're going to start with one click with fifth element and boom followed by Eckert, which looks great. Then we're going down to November Rain. Look at how that looks. Prestige Worldwide gives us that more realistic look. And then we've got Winnebago right here. But I wanna scroll up to Fropack 1 because I wanna show you with one click what Skittles does. Now Skittles gets us pretty close. Now if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash Fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you'd like to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you want to grab Skittles, which is in Fro Pack 1, and you want to get Fro Pack 2 and 3 together, you can save even more with the Triple Play Bundle. Now, let's get back to the video. Below the Q button, you've got another command dial. You can set this to ISO or aperture or shutter speed if you wanted to. You've got the set button right in the middle. That's your OK or your enter button. You got that right there. This is your play button. So you press it to play back your images and the Oscar the Grouch trash can button that you press when you want to throw away photos or delete them. I still highly recommend that you don't delete images inside of the camera because cards 
are big. You don't really need that extra space most of the time. So there's no reason to delete the photos in the camera. Don't worry about it. Just take care of that a little later. Moving on to the left-hand side of the camera, this is where you have a lot of your inputs. You would basically move these rubber things out of the way. This is a sync port. It's a flash sync port. So you have that, you've got your headphone jack, you have your microphone jack, you have a USB-C. The USB-C is great because you can actually power the camera. You can charge the battery through there and power the camera with the battery in there. We use that quite often. You have your HDMI port, which is good if you're gonna do external video recording or honestly, if you wanna plug into a TV or any other device along those lines. So look, they're pretty sealed in here for weather sealing purposes. So they flip out of the way, but you do wanna make sure that you seal them back up. You just press here, press here, press here, press here, press here. Okay, they're brand new. So now it's sealed and there it is just like that. On the front of the camera, we already talked about the release button, but right here you have a remote port. So you can get a remote plug in right there. Just move that out of the way. Let me flip back to the top real fast because there's this icon right here that I never knew what it meant until I figured out what it meant. It means inside the camera on this line, on this plane, that is where the sensor is actually located. Why is it important? I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know why it's important. They put it there in case you want to know. I mean, I, I, I guess if you want to line up that with something, that could be a good thing. So I just figured I would tell you what that is. Right here, you have an, an LED light indicator. So this will help in low light situations. It lights up and helps you possibly focus in lower light situations. It also will blink when you're taking a picture of yourself. Say you do the two second timer or the 10 second timer, it will blink slower and then faster near the end. And then boom, you take a photo. Now this is something that I deactivate in the camera for, for the autofocus purposes. And I'll explain that when we get there. Uh, you have an RF receiver right here. So you can trigger that with a wireless remote. Then we also have this button on the front, which is your depth of field preview button, which I never used in film days and I never use in digital days. So you can remap this button to do something else. Like maybe I want to change my ISO from here. Maybe that's something that you can do. I mean, I don't really use that button very often, but maybe it will come in handy for you. And that basically is everything. I mean, that's the outside of the camera. Now I know it was basic and I know it's the fundamentals, but it's good to see it. It's good to get an understanding of what each thing is. I mean, we're always learning different things about cameras, but now that you pick this up, you know the outside of the camera, and now it's time to move into the menu systems to help you set up the camera. Now we're gonna start with the photography aspect, setting it up for if you're gonna be shooting stills. Now we're setting it up for how I personally would use it. So that's my opinion on how I would set it up. You can go in there and set it up any way that you would like. And we're also then after that going to set it up for shooting video. Now I do wanna mention if you hear some pitter patter like rain, it is absolutely pouring right now here in Philadelphia and we have the roof and it's raining. So if you hear something, that's what it is. So right off the bat, let's hit the menu button. Now you see how there's only one, two, three, and four options under the red menu. You don't have as many options because we are in auto currently. Now the mode dial is up here. If we wanna change it, we don't have like other cameras, a dial that just says PSA and M or TV and AV and all of those things to twist and turn. Here we have the mode dial, we hit mode, and there's A. We're gonna to go to manual, which is where I like to do my shooting, but that's also going to unlock the entire menu system. We have FV, which is flexible priority program, TV, AV. Uh, TV is shutter priority. AV is aperture priority. M is manual. You got bulb. Then your custom menus one, two, and three for C1, C2, and C3. But I like to be in manual because I can take full control of the camera. And look at this. We have now eight different uh, folders here under red or eight different pages that we can choose from. And we are gonna go through and individually go through each one of them. Now I'm not gonna go into super detail about every little nuance of this 
uh, of this menu because that would make this like an eight hour video. But I'm gonna go through the things that I like to use and give you some explanations, starting with image quality. When you go into image quality, you'll be able to touch the screen. I actually didn't mention that I'm using a recorder here so that we can record the menu system exactly as you would see it if you were going through the camera. That's why we're using this recorder. I'm plugged into that, which means I can't touch the touch screen to make any changes, but you can. So just remember that. So let me go back. I'm gonna go back here, just starting again. Image quality, currently it is set, it's set to JPEG large. I prefer shooting on RAW. So I go to RAW here and I turn off JPEG. Now for those of you who don't know what a RAW file is or what a JPEG is, a JPEG is a more compressed file. Think of it as being baked. The camera gets a bunch of information, throws out what it doesn't think you need, and then compresses it into a small JPEG, a smaller file that is called a JPEG. Now in this case, we also have RAW. RAW is all of the data that the camera is capturing, and you have to take the RAW file after the fact and edit each RAW file. That's what I do. I tweak every RAW file in Adobe Lightroom. You can edit the files wherever you can open the RAW files, but just know that RAW takes up more space than JPEG, but I will always shoot in RAW. Next up, we have what's called Dual Pixel RAW. It's currently disabled. We're gonna go in here and we're gonna leave it disabled for now, but I just wanna hit the info button. Wherever you see, let's go back, wherever you see info and help, that means if you hit that on the back of the camera, it's gonna basically tell you what that means. It's not there for everything, but it's there for some things. Basically what dual pixel RAW is doing is taking a RAW file, but it's gonna be double the size because it's in essence taking like two pictures in one, but it's allowing you to shift the focus ever so slightly in Canon's proprietary software. This is not a feature that I personally use, but if you were gonna be shooting say, well, I don't even know what I would say you would be shooting if you would use this. Is there anything you can think of, Steven? Portraits. Ah, yeah, I mean, I guess I could see it making sense for portraits if maybe you're off slightly, but the R5 and the Dual Pixel AF is so good in this camera that you're probably not gonna be off, so I leave this on disabled. Now we've got cropping and aspect ratio. It's currently set to full. What full means is full frame. Then you've got the 1.6 crop factor, 1, 1, 4, 3, and 16 by nine. I am shooting in full frame all the time. That's a personal preference. And if you went to say one to one because you wanted to shoot square format for whatever reason, if you're shooting raw, the raw data will maintain the entire file, but the JPEG will only give you that square. So you're losing out if you shoot in the square and maybe you didn't want square in the future. So stick with full. Into the second menu under red, we've got exposure compensation. I leave this set right in the middle to zero. I don't really mess with that. We've got ISO speed settings, which are currently set to auto. I do not do auto ISO when it comes to shooting stills. I like to take control of my ISO because I personally can do a better job 99.9% .9 of the time than the camera. So I switch this out and look, you can go to 100, you can dial it all the way up to 51,200. But remember, you can also make these changes outside of the menu, but just for now, we're gonna set it to 100 because we took it out of auto. Now, if you were gonna stay in auto ISO, you can set the range for, well, you can set the ISO speed range to say, I don't want it to go past 51,200, which it won't, but it, let's say we don't want it to go past 6,400. You can set it so that it won't go past 6,400. You can also have an auto range saying, well, I don't want auto ISO to go past 12,800. And then you have minimum shutter speed. I have that on auto as well. Next up, we have HDR PQ settings. I personally don't go in here to, to play with any of this, so I skip right past it, to be honest with you. Next up, we have Auto Lighting Optimizer. It is currently set to off. This is another one of these features that I personally leave off because I don't want the camera to make these decisions for me, and when I shoot RAW, I just wanna go ahead and tweak my RAW file. Next up, we've got Highlight Tone Priority. I turn this off. Anti-flicker shoot is actually a really good option. It's gonna be disabled right now, but you enable it when you're in a situation, it says this. It says, if enabled is set, the shutter release time lag becomes longer, continuous shooting speeds may become slower. See, what's happening here, let's say you're in a gymnasium, there's flickering lights. You don't wanna take a picture when that flicker is going on because you're gonna get a weird look in your camera, but you can't see when that's gonna happen, but the camera knows. 
for whatever reason, the fro knows, no, the camera knows. It will wait to take that photo until the er of the flick or the flick of the er, and that way you don't get those issues. So if you find yourself in situations where there's a lot of flickering lights or potential for flickering lights, we're not talking about strobes, we're talking about bulbs and all of those things that you may not notice it, but the camera does, you can enable that, and that way you can have a better chance of getting a picture without the flickering effect. Next up, we have external speed light control. There is a lot of power in here. Say you have three different strobes or flash units set up, outside of the camera, you can control all three of them from here. So if you're into flash and using the flash, you have a lot of control in this menu, so you might wanna play with this one. But right now, we're not talking about flash. We're gonna move on to number three. Would you like me to send you this free guide to capturing motion in low light situations? Well, if you said yes, just look for this orange box over on my website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I will send you that guide for free. Let's start with white balance. It's currently set to auto white balance. Now when you're shooting raw files, you can tweak the white balance after the fact without any issue. If you're shooting JPEGs, that's gonna be more baked in. It's gonna be harder to change that white balance after the fact. I think the auto white balance is one of those features, one of the very few auto features that I use inside of cameras, but I do rely on it and it works very well. Now if you do have a situation where you're shooting and you know the color temperature, like we know these lights are 5,600 degrees Kelvin, we can lock in to that color temperature by going into custom white balance. We will go all the way over to the K1, which I believe stands for Kelvin, and we would set that to not 5,200, we wanna set that to 5,600 degrees. And then every picture we take will be the white balance of 5,600 degrees. So now you know that. Custom white balance is if you have a gray card and you wanna get a custom white balance for where you are, you would go into that mode. Next up, there's white balance shift. That's if you wanna change the, the blues, the greens, the magentas. This is another thing that I personally don't touch, uh, especially when it comes to stills. We've got color space I leave on sRGB, and picture style is currently set to standard, but there are a lot of different picture styles, like monochrome and faithful and neutral and fine details, landscape, portrait, auto. Um, standard's generally fine. I may tweak these a little bit when I shoot RAW because they don't affect my RAW file, but they will affect the preview on the back of the screen when I'm looking at the image I just took. And sometimes I like to have my contrast pumped up just a little bit there. But now would be a good time to tell you that if you shoot JPEG, you're gonna wanna tweak these picture styles. I recommend shooting RAW, but if you're just starting out, I say shoot RAW plus JPEG, so you could always go back to those RAW files. But the reason I say this is important is because if you are shooting JPEGs in monochrome, that means you're throwing away the color data. You're gonna be left with just a monochrome image. You can never get back the color. Now, if you shot monochrome, but you were shooting RAW, the image on the back of the screen would show you black and white monochrome, but the RAW file will still have that color data that you can just, with a click of a button, bring it right back in post-production. So just know that it's baked in. So if you're really, really off with your picture style and you did something, like you shot a bride and they were maxed out to max sharpening, yeah, you're not gonna be able to get that back if you shot JPEG. Next, we've got clarity, which, you know, you could pump it up just a little bit for your preview. If you're shooting RAW files, it may help you out because the preview on the back of the screen will just be a little bit crisper and clearer, but it does not affect your RAW file. We've got lens aberration correction. What do they have? They have, look, I don't mess with this one. Let, let it just do what it's gonna do and I skip on over to number four. I, I don't want noise reduction. I don't want the camera to implement the noise reduction and smooth out an image. I rather see some grain, some noise, than see it smooth and not sharp. Uh, high ISO noise reduction, I turn this one off as well, because when you shoot at higher ISOs, what's happening is you're introducing more noise, you're introducing more grain, but that's okay. I rather have sharp grain, like I said, than have smooth looking images that just look fake. So I leave that off. Dust delete data is another thing that I don't even go into, so I skip over to number five. First up, we've got multiple exposure. It's currently disabled, but you can go ahead and enable it. I mean, this is pretty interesting. So basically, if you don't know what a multiple exposure is, let me take this back to the film days real fast to give you an explanation. So if you were to take a film picture, you take the picture and you don't advance to the next image and you take another picture, you literally exposed that piece of film twice. 
that is called a double exposure or multiple exposure. In this case, I mean, you could do it three, four, five times. It gets a little weird, but now that you can do it inside the camera digitally, it's a good little thing to play with uh, if you want to get creative. Or if you don't want to get creative, you could just do it after the fact in, in Photoshop or something and just take two pictures and put them on top of each other in layers, but this gives you that option to do multiple exposure inside of the camera. Now you've got HDR mode, high dynamic range. I personally turn this off, but I, if I'm correct, that's just affecting your JPEG. It won't affect your RAW file. Next up is focus bracketing. This is actually a pretty cool feature built into this camera. Let's say you wanted to photograph an iguana. Now it's just sitting there. It's never gonna move, probably because it's stuffed or dead or it's a toy, but you wanna get it in infinite focus and you, you're you using a macro lens. You can set it so it will take a picture, move focus, take a picture, move focus, take a picture, move focus, blah, 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 and do the whole thing. And then with software, it can compile it all together and it looks incredible. That is a fun little feature to play with. Number six, interval timer is currently disabled, but the interval timer is a powerful tool. Now in this case, the first way that it's set, it's set to uh, 10 seconds. At 10 seconds, it's gonna take a picture. Then at the next 10, after 10 seconds, it's gonna take another one, up to 10 shots. But you can change this to basically anything you wanna change it to. This is great for time lapse. And by the way, you see that info button? It says, boom, we can go in there and have more details. You can go in here and set the times, like even more hours and even more shots. Like, is it like 900 and, or is this gonna be just 99 or is it gonna go beyond that? Oh, unlimited. So you can have it set to just keep going until you run out of battery power or cards. But yeah, very powerful, lots of great options inside of that setting. Now, bulb timer is currently disabled because I'm plugged into the camera, um, but then we've got shutter mode, electronic first curtain is where it's set currently. That's what I leave it on for the most part. You also have mechanical, which is what you're gonna use if you're gonna shoot with strobes or flash, or you run into any major flickering issues, you'll have a better chance of getting it with the mechanical shutter, uh, but then you have electronic shutter. So this is where you can get that maximum continuous speed of 20 frames per second shooting if you go into the electronic shutter. Now, when you go into the electronic shutter, it's going to be silent. So you're gonna hold, you're gonna shoot pictures and you're gonna see inside the camera that it's taking pictures, but sometimes your finger is on the button and you don't realize you're shooting because you don't hear anything. So just be aware of that. But that's how you get into it with electronic shutter. All right, moving out, we've got release shutter without card is currently on. I still don't understand why that's always on. Basically what that means is you could take pictures without a card in the camera, which means you could be taking pictures without a card in the camera, which then means you're not actually taking pictures. I mean, you're technically taking pictures, but they're not recording to anything. So why would you even want to risk that? Like the time I shot a lot of hockey without a roll of film in the camera. And I was like, damn it. Anyway, number seven. We've got IS image stabilization modes. IS mode is currently on. Image stabilization in this camera is fantastic. That's gonna kelp, help, not kelp, but help counteract any motion, any movement or shake that you have. It allows you to shoot at slower shutter speeds. So if you need to handhold at one tenth of a second, you could probably do it. But keep in mind, if you're photographing a subject that's moving at one, if you're photographing at one tenth of a second and they're moving fast, they may still blur. This camera can't make them freeze at such a slow shutter speed, it's there to counteract your movement. Next, we've got still photo IS is set to always versed only for shoot. Always means it's always active. So you're gonna see your, if you're shooting something and, and you're shaky, well, it's going, you're gonna see IS activated. So you're not, it's gonna be nice and smooth. But if you were to turn that off, then it's gonna be all shaky until you press the button and then it's gonna be active. So I leave this on always. I know this takes a while. These are long, I mean, there's a lot of menus here, but they are honestly pretty self-explanatory when you go through them. Next up, we've got touch shutter. It's currently disabled. I don't ever enable this because I don't want to touch the screen and have it take a picture because there's been times where if you, you know, aren't near the proximity sensor and your nose or finger touches it, it's taken a picture. I don't want it to do that. Image review. Inside of here, I turn image review duration is off. I do not want to see the picture after I take it. Uh, viewfinder review is currently disabled as well. So basically with image review, what happens is you take a picture and then for two seconds, the picture shows up in the viewfinder or on the LCD screen until you get rid of it. And the way you would get rid of it is you would basically touch the shutter button halfway down and then that would get rid of it. But that's annoying. 
if you're focusing on taking pictures, you don't want the other picture you just took showing up in your eye and blocking everything off. I, I don't even know why they offer you that, but turn that off. Next up is high speed display is off. I leave it set to off. We've got metering timer, eight seconds is fine. Exposure simulation is enabled. What this means is that you can see the exact exposure in your electronic viewfinder when you are taking pictures. So if you're overexposed, underexposed, you're gonna see it right in your face or in your eye for, for that matter. Now, if you're using strobes or flash, this is where you would turn this off so that you have just a constant bright viewfinder because you can't see what your flash is going to look like if you have simulation on. Shooting info display, this is another good one. Oh my God, there's a lot in here. So let's go into screen info settings. You have all of these different options, one, two, three, and four. You can see what they do is displayed. But you see how one, two, and three says hit info to edit screen. You can hit info and then you can choose what goes on there. You can change the on-screen buttons, histogram display, electronic level, so you can add all of these things or take them off. It is highly customizable. This is gonna be for personal preference. You're gonna choose what one is best for you. Let me cut in here real quick and remind you that you can check out the entire Canon RF lens lineup over at canon.us slash fro RF lenses. Over there, you can see everything that they offer, including this 50 millimeter 1.8, which I highly recommend as a lens that you pick up. Now, let's get back to the video. Next up, we have viewfinder info toggle settings. This is what's gonna show up in your electronic viewfinder. Let's say I don't like this, I don't like you. I turn you off and I hit okay. But also, see this info again, you can change the info like, oh, I don't, I don't want you, go away, histogram. Go away, information. And then you hit okay, and we made those changes. And then we hit okay again. Now we've got viewfinder vertical display is currently on. This is good. The, the, the numbers that show up, the shutter speed aperture and ISO that show up in the bottom of the display, uh, when you go vertical, it rotates. So it becomes at the bottom. That is one of the, they're one of the only camera companies that do it uh, and this camera does it and it's fantastic. We've got grid display is off. I leave that off. Now, if you need help with rule of thirds and keeping your line straight, you may want to put that on, but I personally do not do that. We've got histogram display. You can change the whether it's the brightness or whether it's RGB. I leave it for brightness. And in the, the display size, it was large and in charge and in the way, I can make it smaller because we don't really need that to be super big if we're gonna put it in our, in our display. So I go ahead and move that one to small. Next up, we've got focus distance display. Um, so in manual focus, but here you can change units of measure. You have meters and you have feet. Uh, we like to go with feet here because we don't know what meters are. But let's put it to meters because I think I'm always used to that. Though I don't know what a meter actually is. I'm gonna go back here. And now we can move on to number eight under red. We've got viewfinder display format. That's fully large, covers the entire viewfinder. Or if you have glasses and you can't get your eye fully up into the viewfinder, you could do display two, which shrinks it down just a little bit, but it still gives you all the same information. I use the entire viewfinder, so I leave it on display one. And we've got display performance. You've got power saving. You also have smooth, which is quick moving subjects are displayed smoothly or power saving. Yeah, I don't use power saving, I just use smooth. Like Rob Thomas and Santana. That's a deep pull, deep pull. Now moving on to autofocus settings, we call this the magenta or pink, I think it's more magenta. We've got AF operation, servo AF. So these two things, we've got one shot. One shot means that if you press your finger halfway down on the button, it's gonna lock focus in. And then if your finger stays pressed on the button, the focus will not shift. Servo is continuous autofocus. To be honest with you, 99,999 times out of 100,000, you're probably gonna be in servo. The times that you use one shot these days are actually more limited than they used to be. Um, maybe inanimate objects that aren't going anywhere, you just wanna lock off, lock it in. That's one thing that you can do, but I stay in servo for just about everything. We've got AF methods. I call this lock on tracking every time, but really that's a face. I didn't realize it was a face till Steven told me it was a face, but lock on tracking or face plus tracking is my favorite mode ever in a camera. 
It's fantastic. It's going to help find the eyes and the face. It's going to help the tracking. It allows you to focus on your composition because the camera's doing such a great job with everything else. But you also have spot AF, which I don't use. You've got one point AF, which is if I really need to get that one point, I'll use spot. Uh, I'll use the one point. You've got expanded AF area. Then you have expanded AF area around, which gives you what? What's that? Nine, one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, that's nine, because that's three times three, that's nine. Um, then you've got zone AF, which gives you a wider area, but the camera's gonna pick the settings inside of the, the, the square to pick the right focus point. Then you could do zone AF for vertical, so it's gonna be a vertical swash in, the, uh, in your viewfinder. It's gonna pick the best focusing point to use. And then you've got large zone AF horizontal, which is a larger box, and it's gonna basically pick the best focusing point. But to be honest with you, Tracking, face tracking, the best option I've ever had in a camera. Subject detection, it's set to people, but you can also do animals or no priority. You're like, ah, I don't care, people, animals, meh, same thing. But in this case, if you're gonna photograph people, make sure it's in people. If you're gonna photograph animals, put it in animals, but don't forget to put it back in people, because I made that mistake. I had it in animals, I was still trying to shoot people, and I'm like, why isn't this working the way I want it to work? It still worked, stuff was still in focus, but it was better when I went back into people. So you just wanna make sure you go into the right area. Eye detection is currently enabled. I love eye detection. It's going to find the eye. We'll show you that later in action, but that is the best thing to use. Continuous AF is disabled. What continuous AF means, it's a little confusing the way that it is here. You might think, wait, why would continuous autofocus be disabled? No, what it's actually saying is if you enable this, your camera just constantly is focusing even if you don't put your finger on the button. I'm not really sure who would use that or where you would use that. I've never personally used it, so I keep it on disabled. Touch and drag AF settings, really powerful stuff. If we go ahead and we enable this, this allows us to select a portion of the screen where we can drag our thumb across it to change the focusing points quickly. It's much quicker than using the joystick. It's fantastic. I love using it. I personally put mine uh, on the right hand side of the screen and I use relative position. This is something you should definitely turn on. It's fantastic. In the focus mode, you've got AF as well as manual. Manual stands for manual focus. All right, under AF, let's go to two. We have manual focus peaking settings. They're currently off, but if you wanna do manual focus, this will help you find the edges and keep them nice and sharp when you are trying to manually focus, which I mean, most people aren't manually focusing, but it will definitely be helpful. Focus guide, that's very helpful if you're gonna manually focus, I would put this on. Basically what it does, it takes two triangles and as you turn the focus, it brings them closer. The further away they are, the more out of focus you are. The closer you are, and when it goes green, that means go take the picture because it's in focus. Uh, I talked about the AF assist beam firing earlier. Uh, I don't need autofocus assist beam anymore. Personally, I turn this off. It's just annoying, to be honest with you. If you see this light, you're, say you're in a dark situation, you're photographing someone, they're doing an interview or they're doing something, and all they see is like an orange light blinking every couple, every time you press the shutter button halfway down. Yeah, it's, it's helpful for focus, but it's a pain in the ass, it, it, it's annoying. So I turn it off. All right, number three. Ooh, Servo AF. There's a lot of different cases here. They are self-explanatory. This is what the autofocus is going to look for when you are photographing. In this case, it's like, oh, case one is versatile multi-purpose setting. You see a runner running really fast about to fall over and you see a figure skater. So you can see what that means. I, I personally leave it in case one just about all the time, but you've got case two, which will continuously track a subject, ignoring possible obstacles, which is pretty good if you're photographing a tennis player. And then there's an obstacle like the line judge in the background or the ball judge or the ball boy, ball girl, whoever they are, you don't wanna get them. Number three is instantly focuses on the subject suddenly entering the AF points. That's good if something is just coming across the screen really fast, maybe maybe airplanes, that could be good. You have tracking sensitivity, which you can control, and then you have auto, which is case A, which is tracking automatically adjusts to the subject movement. Like, this camera knows if you're shooting a bird. It's like, oh, I've seen this before. I've been trained by AI to do this. Um, so personally, a, uh, I leave it in case one. Moving to number four, we've got lens electronic manual focus. If you're gonna shoot manual focus, 
Come play around with this settings. I don't shoot manual focus very often, but play with this setting if that's something that you do. You've got one shot AF release priority. So this is gonna, let's hit the info because this is interesting. Focus priority, no shot will be taken until the subject is in focus. Release priority, prioritizes shutter release over focus. Be aware that the camera will shoot even if the subject is not in focus. So to be honest with you, I kind of just leave it on priority. In older cameras that I had, I would actually turn it to release because sometimes I'm like, it's in focus, why aren't you shooting? And it wouldn't shoot. But to be honest with you, this camera does not miss often, so I would just leave it where it is. Uh, switching tracked subjects info again tells us set the ease of switching to other subjects from the subject currently tracked. Takes effect when the AF method is set to face tracking and all of those other different ones. So you can change this, it could switch to more or it could stay on the initial subject. I leave this set to one, but you can play around with that as well. Lens drive when AF is impossible. What this means is that if it can't find autofocus, do you want it to just stop? Or do you want it to keep trying to find autofocus? I leave it on to keep trying to find autofocus. Next up, we have AF method selection control. It's on MFN. So if I wanna quickly change the autofocus method that I'm using, I literally just hit that button. And when I'm, my eye is up to the camera, I can then easily turn the dial and change the mode that I want. We've got orientation linked AF points. Um, same for both vertical and horizontal. Yeah, I mean, this is, let, let's just read what it says. Select separate AF points for vertical and horizontal shooting. Same for both. Use the same AF method and AF point zone in both vertical and that. Separate AF points. Wow, that's a lot of information for something like this. To be honest with you, I leave it on same for both vertical. I just want the focusing point to stay where it is. So when I go vertical, I don't want it to move on me to say the top. I can control that myself. But to be honest with you, and I need to stop saying, to, Stephen, kick me if I say that again. If I say to be honest with, oh, don't kick me. I didn't mean to say it again. Um, the thing is, with this R5, you don't really run into issues with having to change the autofocusing points when you rely on the lock-on tracking or the face detect an IAF because the camera knows where to go. Moving into number five, the last in AF, we've got initial servo AF point for face tracking is set to auto currently. I kind of have it set in auto, but there is a cool feature in here where you can have it so that you have a focus box that shows up that if you need to quickly move it around with the touchpad that we set earlier, you can move it to basically tell the camera, hey, look here, look in this area. It's there as a safeguard. So that is not a bad option to turn on. I would just recommend try them both to see what works best for you. We got focus ring rotation, I leave where it is. RF lens, MS focus ring, leave that where it is. And then sensitivity of the AF point select, uh, this we ramp up. Now, why do we ramp this up? Because I wanna quickly be able to move the focusing points. There's no reason for them to be moving slow if I want them to move fast. So I put this on plus one, so it is slightly faster. Let me jump in here and say, if you're finding this video helpful, could you please hit that subscribe button? Subscribing really helps out and it also means you won't miss any of my videos when they go live. But also be sure to check out the archive of videos that I have because I have over 3,000 videos. That's three, right? Yes, 3,000 videos that are fun and informative and are gonna help you become a better creative. Now, let's get back to the video. Next up, we get to move to the playback menu. Do I wanna protect images? No. Do I wanna erase them? No. Rotate stills? Nope. I really don't do anything inside of this menu, so I just skip right past it. Print order, photo book setup, another thing I don't do inside of the camera. Raw processing may be something that you do if you shot raw and you wanna convert it quickly for a JPEG and then transfer it to your phone to get it out into the world. I could see that you might do that. Next, we've got dual raw processing. So I guess you can do dual pixel uh, processing inside the camera if you want. Try it out, give it a shot. I'm not gonna resize, I'm not cropping, and I'm not shooting heath, so I'm not converting it to JPEG either. Slideshows, another thing I don't set, but Let's see, magnification. This is what I set. I do actual size. So this means I can just zoom in on a photo when I hit playback so that it's gonna go in to where it's in focus. Um, and that's a great way to know that did we hit the eye, did we not hit the eye? And I love to be able to just jump in with one press of that magnifying glass button and it takes me right into the photo. That's, that's great. Um, image jump, I don't do. Uh, this, I don't touch. The rate button for function, 
you, you actually have the ability to record a memo if you wanted. You would just come in here, you would hold it, it was set that way. Now you could hold it and you can record a little memo to be tied in with that image. So if you shoot for like a newspaper and you're like, this is John Schmo, J-O-H-N, Schmo, S H Mo, Schmo. And then you would know that it was John Schmo. We'll take it back here. Uh, memo audio quality, wow. You could actually do higher or lower. That's insane. Um, yeah, just leave it higher because you got plenty of room to, to put that on your cards. Uh, playback information display is very important. Look, there's 11 different displays here. Not everything is needed. These are needed, like I like seeing the histogram, but I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need that. I definitely don't need that. So look, you go through here and you find what you need or what you don't need. Sometimes you may be like, oh, I like this. It gave me that location information. Or I like this because it will give me nothing. And then you would just hit OK. And now those are the only things that would show up when you do the info display. Next up, we've got highlight alert is currently disabled. This is for the bright areas uh, in your image. Like even the background here is nice. It's, it's bright and white. Well, would the highlights be blown? If there were blown highlights, then if you put this on enabled, there would be these blinkies that blink at you and be like, there's no detail here but that just shows you there's no detail there. I mean, if the photo is exposed right, but there's no detail in a certain area, that's perfectly fine with me. Uh, I, I can leave that, di that could go either way, disabled or enabled. Um, now, AF point display is something that I enable. I like to know where the autofocusing point was when I took the picture, so you will see a red box show up where that focusing point was. Playback grid, wow, you have all these different options for that. You can play tic-tac-toe right inside the camera. Um, playback grid, I, I leave off. Then we've got movie play count. I leave that on record time. And HDMI, HDR output is currently set to off. Um, and if you're gonna shoot HDMI, HDR output, you would then turn that on. Now we go to my favorite menu, the purple one, because my favorite color is purple. My favorite dinosaur was not Barney, okay? It's not. But this is where you set up your Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connection. It is really easy to set up. Just download the Canon Connect app. It walks you through, there's a tutorial right inside the app on how to set this up. You connect via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and the Canon Connect app is absolutely fantastic. You can shoot video from the app, control all of the settings. You can photograph or video yourself. For example, we have a camera set up over there. Is that the R5 or the R6, Stephen? It's the R5 uh, shooting us right now. And I could have the Canon Control app open and I could see that the focusing point could lock onto my eye and follow me. I can hit stop or start. It is a powerful app that I highly recommend that you do try out. Uh, it's a great remote app. So it's really easy to set up. Just go through this follow the settings, the prompts on the screen, it's easy to do. Now you can also do image transfer from here as well. Again, self-explanatory when you get in there and we're not gonna hit reset at this point. Now we got the wrench menu. There's a lot to talk about in here. We got record function plus card folder set. Some really weird wording here. Um, basically what this is showing you is that you would have stills and video going to separate cards. If you had it enabled, I don't. I don't want them going to separate cards, but maybe you do. Maybe you want stills going to one and video going to the other. That's, that's not my style, so that's disabled. Now record options for stills. We've got auto switch cards, which means when one card fills, it's going to go to the next card. Record separately, I don't do that one either. I do record to multiple. What that means is that all of my stills will be saved to card one and card two. It's redundant. I like to do that for security and safety purposes because if something happens to one card, if that happens, I wanna make sure that I have a second card as well. Next, we've got record options for video. It's on standard or auto switch. Auto switch, just like I said before, it's going to finish with the one card, it's gonna to go to the next card. Now, if you think that you can do redundant recording like you can do with stills, you can't. So, you, well, I mean, you can, if you shoot RAW, you can then put RAW to one card and then the MP4 to the second card as a proxy, but you can't say, I want this 4K file to be written to both cards. That's not something that you can do. So either auto switch or standard is perfectly fine here. Now we have record and playback. Being that I only have one card in the camera right now in slot number two, it's gonna do record and playback from slot two for photos and from slot two for video as well. 
and the folder, I just leave it custom set here. But if you have multiple cameras, you could set it up to EOS R1, EOS R2, EOS R3, like whatever you want it to be, you can change those folders if you have multiple cameras. Continuing on, we got file numbering is set to continuous. I always do continuous file number. We don't want to auto reset. I don't want to take 10 pictures, pop the card out, put another card in and have it start at zero, one, two, three, four, five. So I do it with continuous shooting, uh, sorry, continuous numbering. File name, always good to go in there and change it. Like I'll put FRO and then maybe an underscore, uh, but I don't change any of these other settings. I leave it exactly the way it is other than changing the, the file name. Format card, this is important. I'm not gonna do it right now, but you can see that I have 3.04 gigs used. Uh, I have a 64 gigabyte card in there with 59.8 usable, but if I wanted to format, I would hit okay, and it would erase everything on the card, AKA formatting it to this camera. I'm not gonna do that right now, but you see how it says all data will be lost with an exclamation point? They should add two more exclamation points to have three to make a bigger point that you don't wanna do that if you haven't backed up your files. So I always reformat my cards when I put them back in the camera before I go do a shoot, but I also make sure that everything's backed up. So after a shoot, I come home, I back it up, I make sure it's on another hard drive, I make sure it's in the cloud uh, before I start reformatting cards. So reformatting is a big deal, but just don't do it until you've backed everything up and you've double checked that you've done it. Now auto rotate, which is right now it's on on the camera and on the computer. This is like hieroglyphs. You kind of need to know what this stuff is to, to, to understand it at this point. But that's saying that it's gonna rotate a vertical image on the camera so that it's going to only take up, you got this Steven? So it's only gonna take up this portion of the screen, vertical while you're looking at it horizontally. But it's gonna rotate it on the computer, which is more important than anything. So I just put it on to on for the computer because I like when I turn my camera vertically that the, the, that the vertical image takes up the entire screen so that it's just bigger and easier to see. Next we have add camera rotation info. I'm pretty sure this means if you enable it and you shot vertical video for some reason, which I guess it's more popular these days, uh, that it will tell the computer that and it will come in as vertical. Date, time, and, uh, and zone means exactly what it is. This is where you set your date and time and make sure that it's set. And don't forget that daylight saving time when that stuff comes around that you need to go spring ahead and fall back. Menu number two here, we've got language. Obviously, you change it to whatever languages that you want to speak or read for that matter. So it's in English because that's all I know. Video system is set to NTSC. Now we've got the help size is currently set to small. If you're blind like me, help size could be set to standard. I don't want standard. I would call this big, man. I'd call this large but we'll just leave it on small for now. Next, we've got beep for, uh, you can enable it. You could put it, it, it's on touch as it is. I believe that's when you touch the back of the screen and take a picture. It's gonna beep, it's gonna go like beep and takes a picture. And then of course you could disable that if you would like to try them out, see what works for you. Headphone volume, self-explanatory. You can set your headphone volume to what you want. Power savings, you can go in here. We have it set to 30 minutes. Uh, we don't have auto power off or viewfinder off at this point because if I did that, it would mess up my recording. But display off is something that I would put on for like a minute or 30 seconds. Um, auto power off, if it's sitting idle for five minutes, I want the camera to go off. Uh, that, that would explain why the battery was dead today, Stephen, because I didn't turn it off yesterday after we were done recording another one of these for the EOS R6. Um, so yeah, you wanna set those just for the camera to go to sleep. And eco mode, we have off as well. Not that we have anything against being economically uh, uh, aware, but we just, we leave it off. So here we have screen viewfinder display. It's currently on auto one, which means when you flip the screen out, it's only going to show the display on your uh, touch screen. You will not be able to have the ability to look through the camera and use the EVF. Now with auto switch, if you put your eye up to it and you had the screen out to the side, then you could use the EVF or you could use the screen or you could do just the viewfinder or just the screen. I mean, honestly, I would have one or two on. 
Next, we've got screen brightness, self-explanatory. If you want your screen brighter or darker, if you're outside in a bright, sunny day, you may want it to be a little brighter, but keep in mind that if you're trying to go off the, your, your exposure off of a super bright screen, it may be slightly off when you go and take the picture, which is why I have my viewfinder brightness set to auto. Now, auto means that if you're in a bright area, it's gonna make the viewfinder a little brighter. If you're in a darker area, it's gonna make it a little more muted, but I don't wanna set it to super bright because then my electronic viewfinder, which is giving me the simulation for exposure simulation, may not be perfectly represented. And that's why sometimes using a histogram might be good. But I like to leave it on auto and my, uh, my exposures are pretty darn close when I leave it on auto with this one. We've got screen viewfinder color tone. So you can go in here and you can change the tone of the screen, but I leave it on default with, with uh, the number two. We've got fine tune VF color tone. So you can actually change up the viewfinder's color tone, but I leave that the way that it is. And then UI magnification, I'm assuming means if you're blind, double tap the menu screen with two fingers for enlarged display. To, oh, wow, I didn't even know that existed. We have that disabled. I don't even think that's something that I would need, but if you need to see your screen better, I would say just put your eye up to the viewfinder. It's much easier to see the screen that way. Would you like to take better pictures in only 11 days? Well, I created a free mini video course that you can sign up for right now at fronosphoto.com 11 days. Now we've got wrench number four. We've got HDMI resolution. We currently leave that on auto. Next, we have touch control is set to standard. They do give you a sensitive option. I guess that if you cry a lot, it will be like, here's a tissue, or maybe it will talk more quietly to you. But really, if you want it to be more sensitive touch control, you turn that on. And if you want to disable touch control altogether, you could go ahead and disable it. Now the multi-function lock, you saw, I, I talked about these earlier. I'm like, oh, I don't want to use touch. Since we just talked about touch, let's turn off everything. I'm gonna do this. And when I hit save for the multi-function lock, which is right here, if I don't want touch functions on the back of the screen, I would then go ahead and hit lock. And because I set that in the camera, I can no longer use the touch screen until I unlock it. Now, shutter at shutdown. Remember when I showed you how to put the lens on at the very beginning and the shutter was down? That is basically to protect the sensor from as much dust as possible because your sensor is exposed. Now you can have it be closed or you could say that it stays open, which means that it just doesn't come down. I mean, they give us the option for closed, so you might as well leave it closed. That's where we like to keep our cameras. And for sensor cleaning, you have the option of doing auto cleaning at power shut off. You can clean it right now, which I'm not gonna do, or you could clean it manually. Um, I would either do something along the lines of enable this, sorry, you could do at power off, enable says automatically clean the sensor when the camera is turned on or off. That's a lot of extra cleanings. I don't think you need to do that. Or you could totally disable it and go in and do it yourself. I mean, honestly, at auto power off, or sorry, when you turn the power off, that one works perfectly fine. But if I had to really choose, I'd probably turn it off and then only use it when I actually needed it. Now we've got wrench menu number five. We're gonna reset the camera. No, we're not because we just set it all up. But this one is very important. We've got custom shooting modes for C1, 2, and 3. That's where you would set the, the dial. Remember when you hit mode and you could switch between uh, manual, FV, P, TV, and all of those? You also had 1, 2, and 3, C1, C2, C3. Um, and so, for example, let's say you like to shoot outside and it's bright. Well, you could lock in settings for outside that are a good general starting point for C1. And then C2 could be set for if you want to shoot inside and you know that you want that ISO to be higher and you want your aperture to be more wide open and a slower shutter speed. These are things that are quick settings so that you can quickly get into those or you have one for video and one for photos. And that way you can just get there much quicker without having to change too many things in the camera. Next, you've got battery info. We can go in here and see that I've got 53% of the battery left. So far, I've taken no pictures. It uses battery when I sit here and I'm sucking up juice, just showing you guys this stuff. And the recharge performance, if it's three greens, that means the battery is basically brand new. And over time, we're talking years of recharging and shooting and recharging, might you see the performance go down just a little bit. 
copyright information. You can add the author's name, which I recommend, as well as enter copyright details. You can touch the screen for this. I can't because I'm plugged in. But yeah, this is where I would put my name, Jared Poland, Frono's photo. Okay, back to the menu. But yeah, that's where you put your copyright information. I recommend that you do that. Manuals and software URL, if you want to read the actual manual, hold your phone up to this and get the QR code and, and launch that. We don't need to know the certification logo. And firmware is currently version 1.2.0 for us, but when it's time to update firmware, this is where you will go to update that firmware. Now we have a pretty important menu here. This is the orange one, because this is where we get into our custom settings a little later on. But we've got exposure level increments, one third is fine, ISO at one third, speed from metering, ISO, a lot of the stuff I just leave the way that it is. Bracketing auto cancel, same thing as on. Yep, number of bracket shots. So bracket shots means that if you want, if it's set to three, it's gonna take one picture at the right exposure, one, one stop over, one, one stop under, or how, however you decide to set it. But you could do that up to seven shots. So you could do seven shots there. That's what bracketing does. And safety shift, I have absolutely no idea what that is. Let me, let me hit info. Shutter speed aperture to prevent under or overexposed in, oh, I absolutely leave this off, yep. So we just leave this off because I don't want the camera to make some decisions for me. Moving on to number two, we've got same exposure for new aperture. This is actually pretty interesting. Um, you can be like, okay, I want it to keep the same ISO if the aperture switches. Just hit the help menu here. This is an interesting one to read that I actually didn't know existed. Um, and in theory, if it makes sense, when the ISO speed reaches the, the expand ISO speed or ISO shutter speed, or at the minimum maximum speed, the camera may adjust shutter speed, wow. So the camera may actually help you out if you need to help out. I, I still personally leave this off, but it's nice to know that you have that option there. Next up, auto exposure lock mode for after focus. It's just set for this one for evaluative metering. This is something that I personally don't use at all. Restrict shooting modes is currently off. I wanna see what that says. Restricting available shooting modes makes shooting mode selection faster. Ooh, actually, I mean, I don't ever change the modes. I only change it from video to photo. So if I could kind of enable this and get rid of some of these other ones, yeah, I could go in here and say, I don't want auto and FV or P or TV or AV or any of this stuff. I just want manual and C1. I could totally set that myself. Um, set shutter speed range, I don't change that and I don't change set aperture range either. Custom function menu number three, dial direction. Um, I leave this set where it is. I mean, if you really want your shutter speed and aperture to go the opposite way, you could do that, but I'm so used to doing it one way and it's the, we'll call it the natural way or the native way that they have set is what I would do. Same thing with control rotation. Now this is where it gets interesting and in depth. Customize buttons. What I mean by in depth is you have a lot of options to go through here. These are all the buttons that are mappable. Let's say I wanna change this button. Now it's set for, you see the camera? That's telling me that it's for camera mode. Uh, for still mode. If we're in the camera, the video camera mode, then that means that's going to affect that button for just videos. So it's still or videos, it's great. So we can go here and be like, oh, I don't want those options. I wanna go through here and maybe put this in there. You could put that in there. So if you know what these settings are, and you're like, oh, I wanna quickly be able to go to movie recording, or I wanna do dial function settings, you could put that and map that to this particular button. So you go in here, play around with what you like, but if you wanna change the function of the button on the lens, you got that right here for photo, and you got that right there for video. Same thing on customized dials. You can customize these dials. What do we want them to do? What would I like this one to do? Right now it's on aperture, but maybe I would like it to be ISO. Maybe I would like it to be white balance. You gotta figure that out for yourself. It's personal preference, but you can map out all of these buttons. And, and that's how you get to the control ring on a lens. There's a, a lot of the RF lenses have control rings. So this is where you would set how you want the control ring to work. What do you want it to operate? So if you want it to operate the aperture, you can do AV and you can change aperture from that or ISO, which I don't recommend doing. Um, I kind of just actually deactivate it personally and I turn it off because I don't want that ring to be accidentally hit and do something I don't actually want it to do. Steven, should we clear customized settings? No, no the answer is no, because we just set them. So don't do that. Uh, four, add copyright information. I'm not sure why that isn't just in the other menu where you added your copyright information, but yep, 
I want all my copyright info. Oh, that says cropping. Let me take that back. No, I'm taking it back. We're keeping in my mistake, Stephen. It, it, I thought it said copyright info. My eyes are bad. Um, it says cropping information. Off. Leave it off. Audio compression is currently on. This is something that we do disable, correct, Stephen? Yes. Stephen's the audio master here. We, do, we disable that. Default erase option. Yeah, you hit the trash can, the Oscar the Grouch, and then you have to verify it. Um, you've got that. Release shutter without lenses is off. I'm not sure why they allow you to take pictures with just a, without a memory card in there, but they don't want you to take pictures if the lens isn't on. The only time you would ever do this is back in the day, wedding photographers who didn't have macro lenses used to take their lens and reverse it, like Missy Elliott style. And they'd reverse it and they could shoot through it and it would kind of be a really crappy macro lens. It was interesting. Uh, I don't really recommend you do it. Retract lens on power off, you want that on. Add IPTC information is currently off and I, I leave that off as well. And we're not gonna clear all custom functions. And the final menu here for photos is my menu, which used to be a really popular menu for me because it's what you can custom set. You're like, oh, I wanna add something to this menu. Okay, let's see, let's configure it and let's select item to register. Okay, dual roll, I wanna to get to there quickly. So I put that there and uh, I hit, oh, I already did this. So I wanna put the ISO settings there. We can add that there. And now we can go back and they're there. And so you can see I added two things to my menu that I wanna be able to quickly get to, but there's something that Steven calls a hidden gem. My menu display is currently on normal. But if you do display from my menu tab, anytime you hit the menu button from here on out, it's gonna launch right to this green tab. You could still swipe through and get to the other ones, but now you don't have to like swipe through six different colors to get to my menu. You can get there pretty darn quick. So that takes us through setting up your camera for shooting stills. Now it's time to move into setting up your camera and menus for shooting video. And the good news is, some of the stuff is the same throughout this, so it won't take as long to get through. But something very important is movie record quality. We go in here and you can see your different options. Movie record size, we hit enter, and on the top row, you can see the different size options that you have. You have 8KD, which is Cinema 8K. Then you have 8KU, which is UHD 16 by nine, which is where we generally recommend that you live. Then you have 4KD, 4KU, and then FHD. Now that's on the top row. As you go down to the next row, you can see you have your different frame rates. If you can select it, it will let you select it. If you can't, it can't, but I'm pretty sure it's graying it out right now because we're plugged in to the HDMI port. And on the bottom, you have your RAW, your all I, IPB, and then IPB looks like uh, light, IPB light. Generally, we stay in all I, that's gonna give us the best quality. Uh, without having to shoot RAW. RAW is gonna be a much larger file. Popping back out, we've got high frame rate is currently disabled. If we go in here and we enable it, that's gonna give us the ability to select right here, 4K 120. And keep in mind that you do not get audio recording when you are shooting in 120. So let me go ahead and disable this because then you have 4K HQ mode, which is currently disabled. Now that's gonna give you the highest quality 4K. It's 8K down sampled to 4K, which is a really nice quality video. Popping back out, the next thing we have in menu one is sound recording. We've got auto is currently set. You have options to go ahead and do manual. You can see that as I turn this dial, let me go to record level. As I turn the dial, you can watch as it goes down the record level. So if it's something super loud, you're shooting a concert and you want that to be really down, you're gonna dial it all the way down. Hopefully we can shoot concerts again. And then as you dial it up, you can see that my voice right there, that's about right at 12 dB, that's looking good. But what you don't want is it to peak into the red. Be like, red, it's peaking. So that's what you don't want. Now, if you don't know a lot about auto, I keep doing that. If you don't know a lot about audio, you can go in here and leave it on auto, uh, but you also have the option to disable it. But remember, if you disable it, you no longer will be recording audio inside of the camera. 
Uh, we've got the wind filter. I usually keep this disabled because I, it, it compresses the audio really bad with the, uh, the wind filter. And then you have attenuator is currently disabled. Now, if you're gonna be shooting in auto, attenuator should be enabled. Now look, I'm talking loud, but it's not peaking. It's doing a good job. And then I'm gonna talk low, but it keeps the levels right where they need to be, see? See that? Ooh. So yeah, that give you, gives you a good representation of what you are looking at. Number two, we've got exposure compensation. We already know what that does. Uh, ISO speed settings, it's going to be similar to that with uh, what you do with stills, but you can go in here and set it. If you want it to be auto ISO, you could do that, or you could lock it in yourself. Uh, auto ISO is not a terrible place to be if you're running and gunning. Just go ahead and set the max for auto uh, so that you can basically say, hey, don't go above this or that. Next, we have HDR PQ settings. We leave these on off, but if you're gonna go ahead and wanna shoot in HDR PQ, you're gonna wanna play around in this menu setting. Then we've got auto lighting optimizer. We leave this off. We've got highlight tone priority is off as well. Next up, we have aperture, uh, being able to set this to 1 8 increments, which is pretty cool. So instead of 1 3rd increments, you can dial it into like, F4 with seven eighths, and you can just keep dialing it in and it gives you more control over your aperture. Jumping into menu number three, we've got white balance. So just like with photos, remember your white balance is going to be locked in when you are shooting video. You could also do custom white balance, same thing with that gray card. You've got white balance correction, other options there. Picture style, remember this, you go in here, if it's set to standard, that's what you're baking into your video. So when you do that, if you wanted to shoot in monochrome, remember, you're only going to get monochrome video. It's baking that in. So make sure you get your settings as close as possible with your picture style before you start shooting your videos. Now, if you wanna take more control over your files, you can shoot in Canon log settings. That's basically going to give you a much flatter video that you then can tweak in post-production in your editing software to give you, basically you have more control, but you also have to do a heck of a lot more work. And of course with clarity, if you pump that up and you overdo it with your, with your video, it's not something you can really undo uh, at that point. So just be careful with those settings. Lens aberration correction, I leave that the way it is. High ISO speed noise reduction. This is another thing that I disable. I don't like the camera doing any noise reduction, as I said earlier. Uh, we've got HDR movie recording is currently off. I don't have access to it because I'm plugged into the HDMI port right now, but this is something that you can do if you want to do HDR recording as well as time-lapse movie. Time-lapse movie is great if you are, you know, like shooting the stars and you're like, oh, look, time-lapse movie, or you want to have yourself just sitting there. You could do a time lapse of yourself sitting there. Basically, whatever you want to do, you can do. Are you tired of your friends and family looking at your photos and saying, these are the greatest things ever, and you're not really sure because you don't trust their opinions because they're not a professional photographer, but you want to get a professional photographer's opinion? Well, why don't you let me be your mentor? Head on over to fronosphoto.com slash mentorship because over there you can sign up for two different things. One is a 45 minute live mentorship call on Zoom with me, and the other is a 15 minute recorded rapid fire critique. So if you want to get some real feedback about your work, go ahead and sign up for one of those two options. Now let's get back to the video. Movie self timer. It's one of those modes that I don't activate. Uh, it, it's basically like if you wanted to take a picture of yourself, you could have the timer set. But here, if you want to do video of yourself, I could set the camera, press the button, go sit down, and then in 10 seconds, the video would start recording. Back in the day, that made more sense. But now that you have the, the app, the Canon Connect app, it's just easier to use that to start and stop. Plus you can check your focus. It's a heck of a lot easier, so I'm not sure why that's there. You've got remote control, currently disabled, but if you have a remote, that is where you would enable it. We've got IS image stabilization modes, is currently on. Then you have digital IS, which is currently off, but if you're gonna be in more of a shaky situation and you want more than just the optical stabilization, this is gonna give you some digital stabilization for your video, but it's gonna crop in just a little bit, so if you don't really need it, you don't really want to use it. 
Next up, shutter button function for movies. This is actually pretty cool. You can sit here and see, see what to do with a full press. Like, oh, with a full press, nothing's activated. But if we want to start and stop the video from there, you could just be like, okay, I want to be able to start and stop with a full press. Press it all the way, get record, or you could just hit the record button that's up top, start and stop with that. Um, that's personal preference as well. Metering time, still eight seconds. Zebra's settings, you can go in here and turn on zebra lines. That's gonna help you see where you have blown out exposures in the background. You have a lot of control over what you can do with your zebras here, but those of you who know how to shoot video or know a lot more about video can go in here or know what zebras do, but you can activate them and it's gonna help see where your blown out highlights are. Shooting info display. Just like with stills, you can set the shooting info how you would like it. You can see where it says info to edit screen. That gives you more control over what's on the screen and what's not. So you're like, oh, I don't want something. Well, you could turn that off. So just go in here, see what settings you like to have on uh, while you're looking at the back screen. And there you go for that. But also you've got viewfinder info settings, same thing. We wanna change more, we can go into info here. I'm like, oh, I want this to show up and I want that to show up. You can turn that stuff, toggle it on and off, and then you can hit okay. And that's gonna be your settings when you're looking through the viewfinder. So you have a lot of customizable controls of what you see. If you like to have a lot on the screen, you can have a lot. If you like to have a little, you can also have a little. Grid display, I currently have that off. I do keep that off, but if you want it for lines and getting those straight, you might wanna turn that on. Histogram display, we like that to have uh, the, the brightness. I, I like brightness. Basically brightness is giving you the, the histogram for the exposure. And then if you go to RGB, that's gonna give you the histogram, the color histogram. But personally, I don't even know how to read that thing. So I just stick with it for uh, the exposure. Now. Display size, large or small. Small is good enough because you don't need it taking up a lot of your viewfinder. And then we've got focus distance uh, display here in manual focus. You could change the unit from meters to feet or whichever you would like it to be. Next up, it's viewfinder display format. Display one, display two. Display one, display two. Just like we talked about before, if you have glasses on, it's gonna make it smaller so that you can still see the full display. Uh, I stick with display one because I like to shove my eye as far into the viewfinder as humanly possible. We've got overheating control. That's something that you want on. You may run into this if you're shooting 8K video and by May, uh, you still may run into it. Uh, so depending on the heat and, and how hot it is where you're shooting or how long you're shooting, uh, it's good to have that warning on to let you know. Now we are shooting with the 4K HQ not on because we're doing 4K for much longer periods of time and we don't have any overheating with that. Now with our 4K shooting with the current firmware that we have when we shoot 4K HQ, we can squeeze out about an hour or so depending on how we're shooting and depending on the room temperature. So it's really not that bad. Just keep in mind that if you're gonna be shooting for long periods of time, it may you, you may end up overheating just a little bit. Next up is HDMI display. Now, if you're gonna be doing external monitoring like we are, this is a mode you're, one again, you're going to want to get familiar with. Then you've got time code. If you're doing multiple cameras and you wanna sync it based off of a time code, this is where you would go to do that. Next, we move on to autofocus methods, very similar to what it was in the still menu. We have the smiley face, AF smiley face lock on. You can go through all of these as well. I really love this one, the lock on tracking, because it will find people's faces. It will find people's eyes. It's great if you're, you're videoing yourself. It's great if you're videoing subjects. It's unbelievable to see how well this works. Eye detection, I leave enabled, because I like to have that. Movie Servo AF, I have enabled. That means you don't have to hold your finger on the shutter for it to continuously focus halfway down on the shutter. It's gonna continuously focus there. We got touch and drag AF settings. It's currently disabled, but like with stills, we can enable this. And I like, oh, and it's on the right. So now it's enabled, it's right where I need to be with my thumb if I need to move the focusing points to tell it where to go. Focusing modes, autofocus or Manual focus, that's where you can go to make that change. Now we've got the manual focus peaking settings. You could turn this on, of course. You can change the highlight level to high or low, and you can change the color of the focus peaking. Now peaking is meant to help you find those edges, those sharp edges when you're manually focusing, uh, and it gives you a color representation of that 
in your viewfinder. And focus guide is, you turn that on, that's gonna give you that guide with those triangles that when you line it up in the middle, it turns green, and now you are in focus. Number three, we've got movie servo speed, movie servo AF speed. You can have that uh, when active, it's always on. And if you're photographing or videoing someone like me that's moving fast all the time and you want, to, you want it to pick up really fast, you can just pump it up two more stops from the default where it was set and it's gonna be much faster. But if you want more of that cinematic pull, you can go slower, but just know that it's gonna be a slower focus there. Um, we do it faster for what we do, so we usually pump it up to, to, to keep up with me. Movie Servo AF track sensitivity, you've got what's called locked on, or you've got responsive. Look, we also have info. It will tell us what it does. Adjust the responsiveness of the movie servo. AF according to the creative look of your movie and preferred focus transition speed when the subject moves from AF points. Lock on responds less sensitive to other objects when the main subject moves from AF points. Yeah, so with locked on, if you want it to be on a specific subject and then say a giraffe walks by and you're like, I don't want the giraffe, I want the zebra, it's hopefully gonna stay on the zebra. Now I wonder if zebra lines would look like with a zebra. Huh, would there, white parts be blown out and I heard that they're actually brown and that's not black lines. I don't know, but I don't know what they would do. So that's what lock on and responsive is right there. Lens electronic manual focus. I leave all of this set the exact way that it is. I rarely go in and manual focus when I'm doing video. Switch tracked subjects. Of course, initial priority, you've got switch subjects. It's just how long will it stay on that subject? If another subject comes into view, this will determine that. Lens drive when AF is impossible. We want it to continually try to find autofocus. We don't want it to stop, so we leave that on. You've got limit AF methods. Say we're never gonna use these, just like with stills. Goodbye, we don't want you. We turn them off. AF method selection control. We keep it with the MFN button activated. The number four, focus ring rotation, leave that as is. RF lens MF focus ring sensitivity. You could change this if you want it faster or slower. Next up, we have sensitivity of the AF points that are selected. It's still set to plus one. Uh, that's how we set it for stills. That's gonna be how fast those focusing points move around the screen. I don't know why you would want them to move slow unless you just have trouble chasing it around like one of those mouses on the computer. But yeah, we, we leave that set to plus one. Next up, Image playback, this is gonna be exactly the same uh, for stills, so we, we leave it here. We already went over the wireless menu. We already went over setting up the entire camera through the wrench menu. Not much more has changed here. As we go through, you can see it's basically some, basically everything that was there before, and if there's anything different, it's just super minor, uh, but it's basically the same as what you would see with your stills. You still have your battery information, the resetting of the camera, which we're not doing, and then you also have the custom setting menu, the orange. This is all gonna be the same pretty much as well. Um, we already set some of this stuff before, so it's gonna be the same as we set it before, and there's not much else to say there. Just do not clear all of your custom functions if you already set your custom functions. And then finally, you have your My Menu, which is exactly the same as it was when we set it for stills. So now let me show you what you see on your screen when you are shooting video, as well as when you hit the Q button. So on the screen right now, you can see on the top left that it, you are shooting in manual video. You see the little hand that's waving at you? That's letting you know that you have your IS on. You have what your focusing mode is next to that. You've got your 4K video, You get so you can see what frame rate you're shooting in. You have your headphone volume. Uh, we've got the servo mode down below. Your timer is currently off, which is next to that. You've got your shutter speed, which is set to 1 50th currently, and you can see that I'm dialing it up. And then your aperture is at 2.8 slash 4 eighths. That's because we change it to those 1 eighth increments, and you can see what that looks like right there. To the right of that, you've got your ISO is currently set to auto. Your uh, optimi lighting optimizer is off. Picture style is on standard auto white balance, and the number two that you see is the card that we would be recording to. 
Now back to the time, you've got 29.59 left of record time, and then the battery indicator is right next to that. Now the MFN button, when I go ahead and hit that, you can see this is a quick button that cycles through a bunch of different options, very similar to what you would find in your Q menu, but this is something that you can do when your eye is up to the viewfinder and you wanna quickly change the ISO, you hit the MFN button and then boom, I turn that top dial and that's making the change of ISO and I go back to auto right there. So let me get that back here, hit the Q menu, Oop, let me hit OK, hit the Q menu, and now this is your quick menu. It's without having to dive deep into your menu settings for video, you have access to all of these different options. You can see that we can change the different focusing point options. You have all of that, oh, look at that. And it skipped those last three because we turned those off before. Right below there, we have your movie record size. So if you wanna make a change from here, you could just hit okay. And then you can select just like we did in the menu system. It quickly gets you where you need to go. So so we get out of here, hit Q again. Right below here is your headphone volume. You can see that I'm turning the top dial and that is changing the volume and you see your levels as well. And that's the Q menu for video. Now let's jump into the Q menu for stills. So here we go at the top, you can still see the same thing that you can choose which focusing modes that you wanna use. Below that is servo or one shot, so continuous autofocus versus one shot. Uh, we talked about that earlier, you can change that there. This is where you're gonna change whether you're in RAW or JPEG. We wanna set RAW, like yes, I want RAW selected, so I want RAW there, boom. We would have RAW selected, uh, but it's also set to JPEG. I don't want JPEG large, I just want RAW. So there, I changed that right there. Now this is frame rate, so if you wanted to shoot a lot of pictures, you can be in the high plus mode. If you wanna just do single shot, you would go here to high plus, to high speed continuous, uh, low speed. You have your timers here as well, so that's where you would select those. Below there is your metering mode. I generally don't change that any longer, being that I can see everything right in my face, but you've got your partial metering, your spot metering, as well as center weighted average. Generally speaking, you stick it and leave it in evaluative metering. Uh, over here, we've got anti-shot flicker is really good to have in case you get into a flickering situation. You can hit the Q menu to get, to get right here to activate that. You've got your white bounce, your picture styles, you've got your auto lighting optimizer, as well as whether you're gonna shoot full frame, 1-1, one, 16-9, one, four, three, or if you wanna activate that 1.6 crop mode. Steven, do you wanna show everybody the, uh, the, the IAF in action? All right, so we're gonna get the bobblehead out here again and show you IAF in action. Oh, hold on. I've got to get my exposure more right because I'm only at 100 ISO. So I'm gonna go into the, oh, I'm gonna hit the MFN button. Hold on, MFN, and I'm gonna dial my ISO up. Yep, ooh, so good at this. And there you go. Go ahead and move them around a little. Let me let me change my aperture. Watch, you guys see the screen changing? You see, the, you see this? You can hold it for a second, Steven. I'm just speeding up my aperture, but you can see that we have the simulation live in front of my face. So like that is totally overexposed. This is gonna be totally underexposed. And then this is gonna be pretty close to just about right. But now I'm gonna hold the button halfway down. It's actively staying on his eye. Steven's moving around. So you can see as I move, it's staying locked on his eye. So you can take it all the way to the edges and all the way around. So that IAF is really powerful. So now let me just show you what's on the screen. You can see you've got manual, we're selected in M. Next to that is how many shots you will get. The, hundred, the 1,036 we've got left on this card. That's 51 left in the buffer. Then you've got 2959. It's just letting you know that if you did shoot video, you would have that record time right there. Your battery indicator, the hello waving sign, that's what I call it. That is that you have IS on. So back under manual, you've got your uh, focus modes, whether you're in servo, below that you see raw with the card two selected. Then you can see that that's self timer right below there. Then you have your metering options. And then to the right, you can see that anti-flicker is off. It's basically the same thing that you find in your Q menu. It's pretty self-explanatory what's here. We've gone through a ton 
of information in this R5 user's guide. And before we wrap up this user's guide, I do wanna show you right here, I hit the play button to come in to see one of these images. If I hit the magnifying glass, it zooms in. You can see that I can move around with the joystick or you can just pinch to zoom on the screen. I don't have that option because of what I'm, because we're plugged into this right now. But if we hit the info button, you can see how the info changes for how we had it set. You can see your histogram, all of your settings, and we're just cycling through just like that. Now, if you wanted to delete this image, you, would, you could hit the trash can, go over, hit erase, which I'm not gonna do because I don't like being in the habit of deleting photos on the camera. And you can swipe through or you can just turn the dial and it's gonna get through the different images that you have on your card. So yes, this is a long video. If you got this far, hashtag I got this far down below. I wanna thank you guys very much for watching. Please don't forget to give this a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of the videos that we have coming out. But if you do wanna check out the past archives, there's 3000 videos up there for you to check out that are fun and informative. So once again, thank you for watching. Jared, polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.